And absolutely, we are ready to get started. I want to tell you, I could not be more excited for this night. First off, this is our first show for Carrie Miller TV Presents. And, you know, I, I, I put in the comments, this should probably be the last show of the season because I brought on two of the biggest heavy hitters that I could possibly even bring on tonight. Two guys, a few things. Number one, they're exceptional entrepreneurs. They are the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. Their backstories are absolutely amazing. And I cannot wait for you to hear that tonight. Secondly, their motivation and their mentorship is, is above and beyond anything I've ever seen in my life. But most importantly, this to me, and uh, this is my emotional button, I call them friends. Not only do I call them friends, I call them great friends because they're always there for me. They're, they're there to mentor me. They're there to help me. Uh, shoot, I was talking to Carlos last night uh, about one o'clock in the morning, I think it was, you know, and, and we're sitting there just chatting away. That's what a true friend is. That's someone who, who's there for you when you need them. And I can tell you, these guys, they mean what they say. They say what they mean. And it all comes from their heart. So let me, without further ado, bring these guys on. Carlos Seguro and Ron Yeager, the, the, the men of the hour, the men with the power. And these guys have it going on. What's up, guys? Hey, Terry. Hey. Really, Terry. really excited to be here with you. Uh, it, it's 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 awesome, man. Uh, the first thing I want to do, guys, if we could, we're going to just this is just going to be kind of chill tonight. And uh, this is going to be conversation. We just want to talk to the entrepreneurs out there, those that want to be an entrepreneur, those who have dreamed of being entrepreneurs, the business owners out there who uh, are, are struggling right now. Uh, I was telling these guys before the show started, I've had the privilege of. Uh, the blessing, I call it many things, but I've had the opportunity to talk to 402 business owners, employees uh, since February the 17th. And I think February 17th, there was like 13,000 deaths in the world and 77,000 cases of COVID. People were getting scared. People were, were they didn't know which direction they were going. And so when I, when things like this happen, I like to go out and talk to people and share and and, and understand what's going on in the world so I can speak intelligently when I talk to business owners and help guide them and lead them in direction that they should go or that I feel they should go that will help them the most. Because I believe as entrepreneurs, the greatest thing we can do, and that's why I love these two men. They're my brothers. They, they, they're the greatest guys I've ever met. They speak from their heart and they're there to help whether it be one, 10 or a thousand to get to a place where they need to go in order to do the things that they need to do to help you become successful. So with that said, guys, if you don't mind, we'll break it up here just a minute. And I want you guys to kind of tell your story. Carlos is an internet magnet. He is, uh, he is the Amazon guru of the world and uh, his story with his family, uh, his, just amazing. If you haven't seen him on Facebook, he's always with his kids and he's always with his wife and, and he's always out playing with fish. I don't know what that deal was, but he literally killed a koi fish online. <laughs> we try to, we try to save it actually, but didn't go as planned. So Carlos, if you would, buddy, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, uh, where you're going and, and where you've came from more importantly. Yeah, sounds good, Kerry. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to hang out with you, even virtually, now that we have to do most things online. But it's just been an amazing time of reflection these last couple months that we've been at home. And uh, it's uh, there's so many good things about it. You know, I know that there's a lot of struggle and hurt in the world, but at the same time, you choose how to look at things. So if you try to focus on the glass half full, you'll always have that perspective that no matter what comes your way, you can really take that in and react to it in a way that creates more out of it, more abundance, more love, more happiness, more encouragement, more inspiration. And you know, my story has been one of, uh, was really, really blessed to be born in a family in Ecuador, of all places, South America, for those of you guys that are not familiar, Quito, Ecuador, a city where um, the capital of the country, very high up in the mountains, 
I had a great childhood. My parents were both entrepreneurs since I could remember. I had a great uh, upbringing as far as them allowing us to go and fail and, you know, uh, uh, learn new things and be adventurous, uh, both in the in the business world, but also in the sports world and, and just uh, exploring the world. They, they took us around the world. My dad was a world traveler uh, on top of being a, a businessman. So he took us with him on trips to China, to uh, Europe. I, 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 had, I was fortunate, one of my great memories with my dad was he took me on one of his trips to Germany to buy printing equipment. And he had a friend that had a, a collection of Ferraris. And uh, at 14 years old, I, I drove in my first Ferrari in the Autobahn, no speed limit, right? Very scared at the time, I still remember. And uh, his friend was a maniac of speed, right? Like most German guys that have no speed limit with the sports cars will be in that kind of thing. So, you know, these memories really carry on to, to this day. I learned uh, really by watching, by hanging out with him. I was in his business probably ever since I can remember, seven, eight years old, we were there right after school. We would do homework at the office. We would just uh, play with the machinery, play with the different things, started little gigs here and there doing things that were related to his business. And that was how I, I grew up. I was a very, uh, very inclined to, to athletics and sports. So that's another thing that taught me discipline, that taught me work ethic. You know, my dad always said, look, if you're, you're only as good as your word. So if you're going to say, if you're going to do something or say you're going to do something, go do it. Don't complain. Don't back out. Just go finish it. And this was so very important. So, you know, after moving from Ecuador, I graduated from an American school down there. That's where I learned my English. Another wise move by my parents. My mom uh, had a choice to put us in a German school where I would have learned German and uh, Spanish or in an American school. And thankfully, the German school didn't accept us for some reason or another. So I learned English and I grew up being bilingual, which was another big gift, right? Another big gift of having a second language and just being able to communicate with uh, people here in the States. And my dream was to come and live in the States. You know, I had heard and read and, and, and watched on TV how the United States of America was the, le the land of the free, the land of opportunity, the land where things can 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 be accomplished uh, dreams and goals can be reached if you just work hard and uh, my parents encouraged it my parents said hey if you want to go study there we'll help you they obviously were not wealthy by any means but they made a lot of sacrifices to help us come here and while i was going to college i worked full time i attended full time college and you know i i, I really never had it easy and i'm thankful because i never had it easy i had to make uh, I had to supplement what my parents were sending me to uh, come up with uh, food and, and part of my tuition and any entertainment that I wanted to do. I bought my first car when I was in college. It was a, uh, a beater Jeep type uh, Daihatsu Rocky Jeep that I paid uh, $1,500. And uh, it didn't last too long, but it took me from point A to point B where that's all I needed to do. And, uh, you know, these are some of the things that, taught me to uh, really deal with adversity in a good way, right? Uh, I, 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 had to, I had to work harder than the average student. I had to come up with my tuition, which was three times the one of a, of a domestic student, international students pay a very, very high tuition. So I had to come up with that. I worked till 4 a.m. in the morning doing catering for the university. And uh, we served thousands upon thousands of meals to people that threw parties, weddings, and all their all, all kinds of events. And it was messy and dirty. And, and you know, it, we were dead dog exhausted. And, and at 4 a.m. in the morning, we would close the doors, go home, sleep a couple hours, and we had class at 8 a.m. again, right? So those are the stories that I remember to today. And, and of course, after that, um, graduated from college, went and got um, a job at Hewlett Packard that, by the way, didn't come easy either. I uh, knocked on the door and uh, they were hiring interns at the time. They were not hiring engineers. They were not hiring. I, I, had, a, I had a master's in engineering. I had a, uh, an, a, a bachelor's in business by the, that time. And, and I said, hey, would you take me in? And they said, look, we don't have any positions. We don't have any paid positions. And I said, well, I'll work for free. 
you know, I'll do whatever it takes to, to, to learn and work for free. What kind of help do you guys need? So they brought me on as an unpaid intern. I was there for, um, I think it was around six, seven months as an unpaid intern, uh, 60 hour a week internship. Again, I had to moonlight to live in San Jose, California, which by the way, very expensive. My studio apartment rent, I still remember was $1,800 a month. And it was just brutal, right? Because it was my bed, my kitchen or my kitchenette, I should say. And I was, I was so much at work that, you know, I just came home and crashed, but I knew that I was getting somewhere and uh, all these months of hard work, no pay paid off right at the end of the, of that internship, they offered me an engineering job. And uh, at that time I had impressed a lot of people. So that was right when the dot com bubble burst. If you remember Kerry in 2001, there was a lot of companies that, um, we're starting up on the internet. It was the, 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 the days of the, of the internet startups back then. And a lot of the senior engineers went to the startups and I remained because I was barely hired. Right. I was like, man, I'm not going to take a chance like that. So I stayed, even though I made good money, I invested in the stock market in the startups, which was, uh, looking back a bad move, but at least I had a good job and that allowed me to really grow quickly within the company. So within uh, the five years that I was there, I went from unpaid intern to the engineering manager of the laser jet printing division of North America, a uh, very well-paid job, very lots of responsibility over 80 engineers at my, at, at my supervision. We were building plants, manufacturing plants in Mexico, in the Netherlands, in Asia and different places of the world. So I got to travel the world again, a lot. I was single, so it, it didn't matter, right? I was in a plane every every week of the year, and it was fun. It was really fun. But, you know, at the end of the day, I started thinking again, man, I need to do something for myself, right? I had that bug, that entrepreneurship bug that just didn't let me go. And I was young, and I had a lot of energy. So, again, because I had the experience of moonlighting and doing that stuff, guess what I started doing? I started building a business on the side on the Internet, flipping things on eBay, started selling online. And within nine months, I was making double what they were paying me, right? Um, in the wee hours of the night, <laughs> flipping things on eBay, I was uh, doubling my six figure uh, a year salary from, from, from uh, Hewlett Packard. And I was like, I had to make a decision. And, and, and in spite all the advice of all my good, um, good meaning friends, that told me, man, no, you cannot give up an engineering job like this over a, an internet gig that's not going to be around, by the way, right? And I'm like, man, you know what? What's the worst that can happen? I'm going to go give this my all. And if I fail, I can always go back to a job, right? doesn't matter. I was single, so it was the perfect time to take risks. It, 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 I, I, I could fail 10 times over and still not, not really have a huge impact. So it was a fun time of my life. You know, I started and, and I struggled and I learned and I stayed up late every single night, woke up early and just made it happen. You know, I, I started learning the, 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 the strategy of selling online, what to buy, what not to buy. I made money, I lost money. And it was a, a nice period of time of about four or five years where I was learning. It was just learning, right? I wasn't really making a whole lot of money. I was making enough. And, 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 but I reinvested every penny, right? I was making six figures a year plus, uh, doing better than my Hewlett Packard job, but I was making it for my business. And I was reinvesting every penny I had, every penny I had, I lived below my means. And, you know, I, 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 when I was an engineer at Hewlett Packard, I had a very nice BMW M3, which was way too expensive and got me the most speeding tickets I've ever had in my life. And, um, it was a police magnet. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, like, I sold that thing as soon as I got back to Colorado, plus it was useless in the snow. So I sold that thing, traded it in for something a lot cheaper and just went living below my means. And, you know, in that interest, I, I met my wife. Uh, I moved back to my mom's house before me, my wife hired my mom. She was my first employee, hired my mom's husband, my second employee. And then we went on 
full time to build this business and, and it all started in the garage basically right and then we got a warehouse another warehouse a bigger warehouse and uh, then my wife joined the ranks i kind of uh you know kind of tricked her into quitting her job her secure <laughs> job at comcast and uh i told her look i i'm, I'm either gonna have to to hire somebody really expensive or you're gonna have to help me so you know she she kind of she kind of saw the bank the, the bank account growing so she said okay i'll give it a try but i had to prove myself to her right nothing has been without me performing so that i could prove what i was saying because you know you know this carry talk is cheap you can say whatever you want all whatever. day long but if you don't perform if there's no results at the end of that sentence then it is it, just people won't trust you and, and there's there won't be a way for you to get yourself out of that you build a reputation for being just a, a charlatan boy that's a hole that it's impossible to dig yourself out of so right. you know that's one thing that i'm so thankful and blessed that my parents instilled in me is like look you give your word you promise you're gonna go do something you better go do it otherwise i remember my mom's voice right and uh and and i remember one time um i mean i think she probably did put her hand on me a couple times because you know boys are not are not necessarily not mischievous <laughs> but there was one time that i remember where she was just uh it was in the morning and uh i was probably 14 or 15 i had hung out with my friends way too late at night i was uh i was going on maybe two or three hours of sleep and uh, she was making us clean the house and she, she said something and I raised my voice and I said, mom, shut up, right? And as soon as I said that, I regretted it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna die, right? And then literally she started chasing me all over the house and she caught me at the front door of the house. It was locked so I couldn't escape and she had the broom in her hand and she just split that broom on my arm <laughs> and this was already outside by the yard so it was between the the actual front uh, front door of the house and the actual you know yard door so my brother was uh, watering the grass and to save my life my brother grabs that hose and starts spraying my mom with water right to, to tell her to not not uh, murder her uh, her son <laughs> and 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 you know, before she could you know, turn back and go kill my brother, she just started laughing, right? She just, she just couldn't, right? So, you know, those are some of the things that, that, that made me who I am. I could tell a hundred stories and I know we don't have that kind of time, but uh, um, fast forward a little bit after this long journey of building my business, I've been doing internet business for over uh, 50, 20 years pretty much now. And I have multiple uh, seven and eight figure companies. I am one of the top Amazon sellers in the world. And I consult and advise hundreds of brands as well as part of my, uh, one of my companies and we provide fulfillment services and we, you know, uh, we're really so into uh, tapping the full potential of the internet in business in every single one of my ventures. And I love it you know it's 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 been i knew the internet came to change our lives and i was thankful that i saw that early on caught that wave with um, my surfboard and i never got off <laughs> right <laughs> i've been riding it ever since and i'm gonna continue to ride it until probably i cease to exist in this earth because you know it's it's a technology that really came to change our lives every single business and if people choose to embrace it i mean it can change change theirs too and it definitely will. And I will tell everybody only on Carrie Miller TV presents. Will you hear a guy confess that his mother beat him with a broomstick <laughs> out the front door? Guys, this is classic. We'll, we'll be on ABC next week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and, and I will say this. And before we, uh, we bring Ron on and Ron's going to tell his backstory and just an amazing guy. I mean, his, his story just, it, it's everybody's dream. Both of these men, it's everybody there. They are everybody's dream and they are proof in the pudding that if you have a dream, it will come true. But I was talking to Carlos and I mentioned this at the beginning of the show, you know, at one o'clock this morning, we were texting and, and he told me he, we were talking about uh, Dr. Nicholas Porter and, and, and 
Carlos has taken the bull by the horns of a company that we're all three involved in. And, and he said, you know what? He said, I gave my word. I get emotional a little bit. Mm -hmm. I gave my word to Dr. Nico that I would carry this through. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I heard those same words last February. I was sitting in a parking lot at Burger King because I wanted to talk to Carlos about a direction that we were all going. And that night at about eight o'clock pouring down rain in a Burger King parking lot, Carlos gave me his word. I knew then that he was a man of integrity. I knew then that he was a man that would go into the fire first. And I knew then that he was a guy that I would follow to the end of the world when it comes to building a business, being mentored by someone who's been there and that he would always be by my side if I needed him. So, and I thank you for that, Carlos. That means so, so much to me because Thanks, really. you earlier you can be a charlatan but be the knight in shining armor on the top of the white steed and lead the parade. And, and, and that's what you do, my brother. Yeah. Right. Brother, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor and he's not pretty. Most, most of the time people, people sure. see that people see the, 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 the end of the tunnel, right. When right. things are already pretty, but the journey to that <laughs> is, is not, it's, you know, you, you gotta get in the mud. That's right, and, and, and wrestle the, the 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 wrestle the dragon along the way. So <laughs> now, appreciate it, buddy. I, I appreciate you a lot. You know, that. all people see is the success, right? They don't see they don't see your face down in the dirt with the arrows in your back. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely, Ron Yeager, my friend. Yeah, Gary, uh, yeah. Let me tell you something. I first heard Ron. Uh, gosh, it's been several several months ago. And he was kind of giving a stock market update kind of deal inside of our, our training group that we have. And I was mesmerized. And I thought, man, this is my man. This is the guy. Because he talks, the, he talks stuff that I love. Numbers, realism, truth mm -hmm. in today's markets, yep. where we are, where we're going, where we've been. And the things that we need to do in our life to stabilize where we're at. And we're going to get into some Q&A here in bit, just a few minutes. Ron, if you could share with us your backstory. I know you've got a great story and we'd love to hear it, buddy. Well, uh, let's see. I'm, I can't uh, can't remember the time my, uh, my mother beat me with, with a broomstick or anything along those lines. But I'm... Uh, <laughs> We're not going to get any dirt from you. Then. I'm going to have to dig deep to, to uh, uh, match Carlos on that one. So, uh, no, I, I was literally born. Uh, I was I was actually born in Mexico. Uh, my grandparents on, on my mother's side uh, were entrepreneurs and uh, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, some of those stories. And we don't have time to get into that at all. Uh, on my dad's side, uh, there's some pretty interesting history. And uh, uh, my my uncle, uh, my dad's older brother, uh, is, is Chuck Yeager, uh, first man to uh, break the sound barrier. So um, my my mother raised in an entrepreneurial fin uh, family, and uh, my dad was uh, from uh, from West Virginia, the backwoods, and that's that's uh, it was an interesting combination. Let's just put it that way. And I grew up uh, for the most part after we um, uh, moved in into uh, into the states, and then uh, uh, my dad got transferred down to Houston, and so I spent most of my time growing up in oil country, you know, like you, Kerry. And um, you know, it was a very entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, learned a lot about the oil business. I, I came out of uh, college. I actually went to Texas A and M, uh, and came out and, and immediately went in the financial world in the early 1980s. And it wasn't very long that I was with Lehman. Uh, long after that, I was uh, actually with Lehman Brothers. And, and uh, boy, it was some, some amazing, amazing times. We were seeing swings in markets that were just absolutely unprecedented. 
And the one thing that I did that really helped me out is that I sought out a lot of wisdom and knowledge uh, from the brightest people that I knew that existed on Wall Street. And I did everything I could to get around them. I spent a lot of money to uh, access some of this information at times. But I learned so much about trends and, and being uh, positioned ahead of the crowd and how the crowd tends to be uh, very late on making things happen. But long story short, you know, we, we've, we've got uh, an, an economic environment that's shaping up today that's unlike any time anything we've seen in our history. But before I dive into that, I just uh, I do want to share kind of a funny story uh, when we were in Houston. And at that time, I'm in my 20s. Um, I'm, I'm making more money than I knew existed on the planet. I mean, I, I, I we were we we're middle class family, um, but we loved adventure, and and we were always doing all kinds of crazy things. And so one of the things we did was. We had this annual backpacking trip that I would go on with my dad, my uncle, and there was usually some kind of celebrity or or uh, one of my favorites was Victor Belenko, who uh, defected with a Russian MiG and uh, flew across you know the Sea of Japan and landed at Tokyo International Airport and delivered us a, a MiG uh, uh, jet that uh, was was kicking our tails in dogfights uh, when we would come up against them. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, aerial combat or maneuvers and things like that. So, so we live off, uh, we go up into the mountains of the Sierras near Edwards Air Force Base and live for two weeks off the, uh, off the trout, uh, that we're, uh, catching and, and, uh, just, just a phenomenal, phenomenal experiences and, and, uh, being able to pick the brains of people that fought in World War II and, and all these incredible things that they did to, give us the freedom that we so enjoy today. And unfortunately, I think so many people will certainly take that for granted. And, and certainly a lot of our freedoms are coming under enormous challenges uh, at this point. Right. But we, uh, the story I want to share was we were going to uh, coordinate a trip uh, into the Sierras and um, Chuck was flying into uh, to Houston. And so, uh, and Joe Engel, who was a uh, shuttle commander uh, for the space shuttle. And he and his son, John, who was going into the, uh, the Air Force Academy, were going to fly up from NASA and meet us in Northwest Houston at a, uh, at a small airstrip. Well, Carrie, the best way I can describe that plane was um, Sopwith Camel comes to mind. It, it was uh, Joe's, Joe's plane, uh, or, uh, his, son's, his son's plane, it was a tail dragger. It had no doors on it. Okay, so um, the only avionics was a um, the fuel gauge, which was a clothes hanger with a cork in it at the end of it, and that basically was the fuel gauge. So you know, here here you have Joe Engels, a shuttle commander, but shuttle commander, but his son John is flying this aircraft. So uh, shuttle commander's in the right seat, and they fly up. We have some barbecue. And, uh, and now they're going to take off and head back to NASA. And um, Chuck leans over to me and says, you want to go have some fun? And I said, what do you got in mind? He said, well, I've got this bonanza. And um, let's just go escort them down to NASA. So anyway, um, this little bonanza is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice little aircraft, but much faster than this uh, Sopwith Camel. Top speed on that thing was maybe maybe 60 miles an hour. I mean, if a strong wind, it's going backwards. So we catch up to them over downtown Houston. And I know you can't do this today, but we were dogfighting with this Bonanza and this Sop with Camel. And it was some of the most acrobatic flying I've ever seen because I thought we were going to fall out of the sky in any minute. So anyway, um, I, I've had some fun in uh, See, Ron, you probably could have done that then, but you did. <laughs> yeah, well, we, yeah, we, somehow we got away with it. And, and uh, you know, he didn't get, uh, Chuck didn't get questioned a lot on, on um, some sketchy things he did. But so, you know, I come from a background of, of risk takers would be an understatement, I think. Um, and, and, but it's a measured risk. 
you know, one of the ba big advantages that uh, my uncle had in his dog fighting days in World War II is he knew his plane better than the engineers that designed it. And he would actually go to them and make recommendations for changes and things like that. So what I took that is and applied that to my financial career is I needed to know more about how the markets actually worked than anybody else, if you will. And as we speed forward today, um, I've always been looking for a better way to make money. Okay, I've always looked for a way to be able to build passive uh, income flows so that and, and also looking to try to find a way to leverage time. Most people tend to go in the direction of leveraging finances, and I've gone more in the direction of trying to find ways to leverage time. And so as, as we come forward today, so many people have been absolutely surprised, we all have, by the speed with which this economic downturn has developed. And, um, uh, and, I, and I just hope and pray that people are not assuming we're going to go back to the way things were because these changes are going to have very, very long-term impacts. And you, I believe you have to really adjust your thinking for a different world. And it's going to be hard for, I think, most people to, uh, to do that. I think it's going to be very hard for somebody to ramp up any kind of a business um, without taking an awful lot of risk and taking a lot of time to be able to uh, try to sort these interesting times we had ahead of us because some of the best hedge fund managers that I know in the world that are billionaires really don't know if we're going to go into a big inflationary or big deflationary environment. And, and how do you navigate that? How in the world do you prepare yourself for a time for, where some of the brightest minds in, in Wall Street and, and the financial world really don't know how things are going to be long term? So uh, that's one of the one reasons we're so excited to uh, uh, be sharing with you, Carrie, about um, uh, some ideas that we think that might be able to help people more effectively negotiate. Um, let's just put it this way, some interesting times that we believe we had ahead of us. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think uh, I think the times are, I don't think we've seen anything like we're about to see. And, uh, you know, I, I know talking to the people I've talked to over the last several months, uh, my clients, you know, people that are in business, people that I have sold product to to help them build their business, uh, they don't know which direction to go. And and a lot of that is and, and I'm going to get you and Carlos both to chime in on this. We have always been taught our entire lives. We go to college and we get. We pay a lot of money to get a, a high education to to be an employee. And then we're never taught how to actually make money. We're never taught how to carry ourselves through when we make money. And, and then we're not taught how to actually manage a business so we can leverage ourselves into that business. And you mentioned that word leverage earlier. And uh, this, this is kind of for both of you guys, you know, businesses today, essentially, especially the mom and pop businesses are broke. I mean, we've gone 60 days now. They still have uh, rent to pay. They have employees to pay. They have insurance to pay. They have all these things to play, pay, and they've run out of the money. And so what we're having to do today, and, and, and I, I thank God that I, I did it and I won't, and I'm not going to take any type of loans because I don't want someone else, number one, owning my business. Number two, I don't want to have to pay someone back mm. because I didn't prepare. So from, from a business standpoint, from both of you guys and from the leveraging standpoint, uh, Carlos, in your situation, and I know that that you've prepared and, and you understand business and you understand leveraging and, and multiple stream of income, uh, because we all know that sometimes one stream is down, another stream is up and and it's kind of like the stock market, like you see behind Ron there, you know, it's up and down. But when you have multiple streams and you and you do multiple things, 
everything kind of levels itself off and, and that anxiety that we're going through today uh, kind of subsides because we can take care of ourselves. And uh, so, uh, Carlos, if you would answer, talk about that as multiple stream company. You have multiple streams of income in, with your business. And then, Ron, I want you to talk a little bit about when he gets done, how companies today, how, how your mom and pop businesses, how business owners today using multiple streams of income can leverage themselves to where they're not in the situation that they're in. Go ahead, Carlos. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, look, I... I learned a hard lesson back in the dot-com bubble because I wiped out my 401k in the stock market back then. You know, I was very aggressive with the money that I was putting away for retirement, right? At my, <laughs> my, in my twenties. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I was putting my fate in somebody else's hands, right? I was, I was uh, trusting somebody else to manage my money and that's never a good idea. <laughs> So I really learned that these events, these episodes are bound to occur sooner or later. And then just understanding what had happened in history, these things happened every so often, right? We don't precisely can tell, look, this is when it's gonna happen this year. You would need a crystal ball for that. But I knew it was coming. And when you know that a storm is coming, the wise thing to do is to buy an umbrella, right? <laughs> the wise thing to do is to shelter yourself in some way. So it was is a multi multi part preparedness strategy that really what I've understood over the course of my business career is look, I've lost a ton of money just as, as much as I've made a lot of money. Thankfully, I've made a lot more than I've lost. So my, my, my average has been in the positive side, but I always knew that I needed to be in industries that were recession proof or recession resistance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that I needed number one, to save a lot of money. It was important for me to save a lot of money, um, not be too aggressive with my investments, live below my means, so we've always, Myra and I, my wife and I, we've always lived below our means. To this day, we live well below our means. We live very well. We're very comfortable, but we, we live well below our means. Um, and I'm so very blessed that I married a woman that is frugal, as frugal can be, right? <laughs> that woman could write a, a six-figure check for a couch, but she refuses to buy anything unless it's a good deal, right? So... Um, you know, I love her to death. And really, the multi multiple streams of income is something that resonated with me because I really knew, um, and I think it goes along with my personality too. I, 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 I'm curious. I, I, I like to learn new things. I, I'm, I'm hungry for knowledge. So once I figured out the e-commerce thing and I knew how to put that on sort of all autopilot because, look, one thing that we need to understand is like, I, when I'm starting something, I'm all in into that one thing, right? Because that's the energy that you need to right. get something off the ground, especially in my first early days. So when I was doing e-commerce, that was my thing 24 seven, right? I wasn't building three other things at the same time. I was focused. Once my, my, my main e-commerce company took hold and was profitable and was, had capital and we had enough resources to really start delegating a lot of these things. And I was good at that too. I started delegating key positions. I started allowing people to do jobs that I didn't like to do. And even though nobody will ever do the job of the owner at the, at the quality of the owner, feeling comfortable with somebody doing 80% of that, right? And, 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 and not micromanage everything. So eventually we started growing and then I started diversifying into different things. And I've, I've, one thing I've done well over the years is I've pivoted when I saw events coming, right? So uh, in my e-commerce career, even within that career, I've seen certain uh, verticals within the e-commerce business where a certain 
category might not be doing well moving forward, um, all my colleagues that are in that one category continue, right, and persist while I'm like, hmm, this is not going to do well. It's, it is not performing well in the last few quarters. I'm going to pivot to something else that I feel is trending. So I've been able to switch gears, move to another category, leave that one behind, be able to say no. It's important to say no just as it's important to say yes. Be able to say no and keep things moving on a positive note. And that's why today, you know, we sell products, we sell services, we have streams of income that are uh, overseas. Even, even that, right? I, I, I knew that at some point they need to start doing business with people outside of this country because the internet allowed to do it very easily. So, you know, over half of our portfolio of clients in my, in my, in my companies is in other countries, in, in 21 plus countries in the world I have clients. So, you know, it, it, is, it is not dependent on one economy it is not dependent on one technology. It is not dependent on one category of products. It is, it is, so, it is so diversified that now, and man, this whole thing when it hit and, and, it, and, it, and, and really exploded e-commerce, exploded internet, um, I can tell you we have been barely keeping up with the demand for our services, for our products. Um, we've had record months in April uh, record months in March. We are having a crazy m um, month of May as well. And um, we're helping people along the way. You know, that, that's the thing. Our employees are uh, pulling all kinds of overtime. So they're able to help themselves and even cover for their families that are not working. You know what I mean? We've hired a whole lot of, a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of kids that were about to graduate but couldn't graduate, right? So they're out of school, might as well come help, right? <laughs> so a lot of parents in my, in my businesses have, have said, hey, Carlos, can I, can I bring my kid, right? Uh, they're, they're a working age already. Can I bring my kid to help out? And I'm like, yeah, man, of course. Please do, right? Who else can I trust if not my employees' kids to, right. to do a good job for us, right? right. That has been a blessing. So, you know, in, in, the, in this whole thing, being diversified, having multiple streams has been a key thing that has helped us continue to thrive and, and provide employment for people and to, you know, meet the demand of customers. And of course, you know, we feel it for so many businesses. And that's why I feel this immense obligation and responsibility to share my knowledge, my experience, my strategies, my success with people that need it right now to keep afloat or hopefully save their business, if not thrive. Right. And, and, and that's so true. And, and, you know, it's, there's one thing I've learned as my years have gone and I was talking to these guys before the show and, and my first million dollars, I was pretty selfish. I was pretty arrogant. You know, I was driving the sport sports cars and, and, and doing those things. And then I realized if you want to truly be successful, you help others to become successful. That's where the real reward comes. <clears throat> you quit worrying about what's in the bank and you worry about what's in your heart and what you can give to others and teach them to do the same things. And Ron, there's one thing I have learned during this pandemic. And I grew up in the restaurant business. My father owned a restaurant. I was washing dishes on a milk crate at seven years old. And and learning about the restaurant business. And, and I always knew margins were tight. And no matter what the business is, the margins are tight. Overhead is high. You're paying two or $3 a square foot for rent. You know, you've got insurance today. You've got so much overhead today. And now that this pandemic has hit, what we're seeing is, is most businesses can't make it 60 days right. and without, without literally afraid the doors are going to shut. They didn't, we, we weren't prepared for that really to no fault to our own because we never had to really go through this during our time. Mm -hmm. But now we realize that, Hey, we've got to have a different mindset. We've got to put ourselves in a position to leverage ourselves to where we never ever have to do that again. And there's one, I've, I've been doing this since 2011. I've, I've been, 
I'm like Carlos there. I focus solely on one product. When I get that making money and I get it right where I want to be, then I move to a different stream and I create another stream and I move when I get that. I'm very laser focused when I do things. I think businesses today have realized that they have to really laser focus on leveraging their business using other streams of income mm -hmm. in order to make sure that they get through a situation like this. Right. Businesses go through enough hard time as it is to have to worry about if they're going to be able to pay the light bill in 60 days because the business drops. So share with our audience, if you would, a little bit about using multiple streams of income to leverage yourself so that when something like this happens, you just keep on trucking. Right. Well, I think the biggest challenge that people are facing right now is the unknown. There's, you went from just think just a few months ago to you knew how 2020 was going to go. And all we were talking about, uh, to be quite honest, was impeachment at that time. Right. The economy was humming along. I mean, 2020, yes, it's going to be uh, pretty interesting because the election upcoming, but not, not much else was in our wheelhouse, okay? Oil was doing fantastic. I mean, you know, you think about the Texas economy, what it's based on. Technology was is you just been skyrocketing. And so what people really didn't realize is, is how much – all of this has been really kind of leveraged by massive amounts of debt. And so let's put ourselves in mom and pop's shoes for just a second. We've been hit with a, a curveball out of left field. We all have. But as you were just saying, Carrie, these mom and pops, they don't have, they don't have the time frames to keep these businesses afloat. Okay. The very, very short time frame they're, going out of business at record pace at this point. And so my question for people is, what do you do? What kind of course of action can you take? How do you reinvent yourself in a short period of time or start with a new business that can take you where you need to go with these cash flows? Okay. So I think what we need to really be looking at is new business models business models that are much more efficient than the old models from the last century and, and beyond. So that's one of the things that we've talked about extensively with Dr. Nico and, and uh, all of us is we believe we've created a, a business model that is uniquely designed for a world in transition. Okay. So when you, that's the thing that I really think people need to be trying to find for themselves, how do I build cash flow that can take me through an economic environment that I really don't know how it's going to go because your financial advisors right now are, I, I, I know a lot of these guys and they really don't know how things are going to be shaping out six months from now, 12 months from now, two years from now. So I believe you have to build a business income stream that can do well in any type of economic environment that goes forward. It prob probably needs to be built on products and services that are used and consumed every day and have to be you know, repurchased. And, and so, and then you want companies that are ideally debt free, privately held, they don't need the stock market to survive. So I think in mom and pop situations, people are literally having to think about how do I start making money from home? Okay, we're being quarantined at this point or on lockdown. And who knows if this thing is going to go through two or three iterations of what we're going through right now. So do I try to build a business that I can manage in that fashion? Or do I try to keep my existing business ongoing? Well, I would strongly suggest that you find a business that can generate these kinds of cash flows that can be ideally built from home. Uh, preferably, it's more of a turnkey situation so you don't have to have a long time to ramp up in your knowledge of how to build a business, which equals risk, because the speed with which this thing has hit us, I think requires people to think in terms of speed to make adjustments and, and really 
not say, okay, we're going to get through this over time. And um, I probably just have to just kind of see how things are going to settle out. I would strongly disagree with that. I would strongly recommend that people look for answers, look for solutions that preferably have very low to little risk, um, preferably no risk if, if, uh, if possible, and um, get yourself a positive cash flow that can help fund your existing businesses and get you through this uh, interesting times that we have. Yeah, that leverage is so, so important. Yeah, I mean, I, I've built my business. I'm, I'm a recurring income guy. Every business model I've built has been simple product, you know, involvement, a uh, couple of three steps to get through and then uh, come out the other end with recurring uh, residual cash flow. And, right. uh, you know, when you're selling hamburgers and that's the only thing you do, or when, when you're selling jeans, the only time you have a residual customer is when the next season comes mm. and uh, they come in and buy a thicker pair of jeans. And, and, and Carlos, what should people look for today in your eyes? You, you, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I can, you, I should say this. Now. Carlos is an eight figure earner. He is, this is no, uh, this isn't a guy that just uh, came up from Ecuador. He he fought the hard fight. If you didn't hear his story in the beginning, please rewatch this. He fought the hard fight coming up, man. He was sleeping on the couch. He was eating beanie weenies, you know, spam because he couldn't afford the grease to fry it in. I mean, this is a guy who came up the true American dream story. Okay. He came up from Ecuador, amazing family, amazing growth, support out that that's unbelievable. Where should businesses go today, Carlos? What should they be looking at right now at this time from a guy who has been there, who has fallen, who has got back up, who has fallen and finally realized this is where I need to be? Look, I think that a lot of businesses have taken the Internet for granted. It's been a technology that came to change everything that we know, the way we communicate, the, we, the way we we take transportation, the way we order food, the way that we, um, you know, everything has been transformed. However, even with that being the case, and you'll probably agree with me, Kerry, most small businesses in America are way behind the times in leveraging the power of the internet to their advantage for their marketing, for their e-commerce, for, you know, every single little thing the average small business owner was completely caught by surprise with this event. I mean, I've seen you uh, working with restaurants that needed to establish a simple, uh, you know, takeout order type of thing. Well, you know, how is it how is it possible that in this day and age that restaurants don't even have a way for people to order online their food, right. and it's because they got comfortable. You know, uh, business in America got comfortable because we lived in a decade plus of prosperity, of abundance. And when everything is given to you, practically, it was very easy to be in business. We are entering the era of the real entrepreneur. The real entrepreneur has to struggle. Yes. The real entrepreneur has to learn how to deal with adversity and become innovative, become creative become adaptable. These things really are things that give you the character to go deal with situations like this one, right? Because look, I talk to a whole lot of business owners just like I do, like you do. There's a small percentage of them that, that when, when, when this first hit on day one, they were already thinking, this is what I'm gonna do to save my business or even thrive right now and run into the storm, run into the fire, fight it hard, give it all I got. And then the vast majority of them were sitting at home waiting for their loan or for their handout. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 And, and, it, and, it, and it's sad and not, not to, not to, you know, bring anybody down, but it's just the mindset. So, there's going to be invariably a whole lot of businesses that don't make it. And that's sad. 
th that is very sad because that has impacts not only to the business but to employees to families behind that to many things but it is a huge learning lesson for so many business owners entrepreneurs in america that look number one you got to prepare for this kind of times number two you got to become a saver you got to save some money you know you got to have six months in the bank of reserves if you can number three you have to take full advantage of the internet in no matter what business you decide to embark yourself on and this is something that has to be a must even if you're making crafts at home and you're wanting to sell those learn how to sell those online yep. right learn how to leverage the internet no matter what business you're in learn how to leverage the internet to its full potential in your current business if you can now if your business is not going to survive then shut the lights go home grieve because we all have to grieve the losses learn from those losses don't you know don't carry that with you forever thereafter and then start fresh with a whole new outlook about what business needs to be and the reality is that people will always consume goods people will always eat people will always buy things online people will always need to be in recurring consumable item businesses so if you're so inclined go into that right and make it work because that gives you safety in itself mm -hmm. if you build a real business right if you put the effort energy that a real business deserves because that's another thing that you know there was a lot of absentee ownership in business during the prosperity times Yes. Because you, you could run it with a manager, not anymore, Kerry. Right. This new economy we're entering in, you're going to have to be hands on. Mm. You're going to have to be there. You're going to have to. You're going to have to really seek to retain every single customer you have, because now they're not going to be coming in abundance. You're going to be. They're going to be very selective. People are going to be more careful with their money. People are going to be more careful where they spend their, their, their dollars. And they're going to be always thinking, is this going to happen again in a couple of years? Right. right. So that's something that we all have to sit, sit back, analyze, think about it in the context of our current business and our future plans or <laughs> your career, your job, no matter what it is. Um, always think, you know, you make some, some, some thoughtful, conscious decisions of what to go into. And once you find something that is on the right track and you see it thriving, no matter what, man, give it your all, right? Give it your all, give it your heart, soul. Um, don't hold back because that's another thing too. Sometimes people tend to be very cautious when they've had a disappointment, yes. right? And that cautiousness turns into these um, half, going half in right and having plan b's and, and and having always a place to come back and step back into the comfort zone and say oh man that that feels too risky i don't think i want to do it but look no matter what you do you got to burn those ships behind you mm. you 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 gotta go all in right if you fail you fail but at least you give it your all right and, and no. i i I'd rather i rather fail 10 times over yes. than have somebody terminate me at, at a job. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. 10 times over. I'll, I'll, I'll go fail in 10 different enterprises, lose millions of dollars before I allow another human being to control my future. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So that is the thing guys for entrepreneurs listening and business owners. It is always best if you're writing your own check. That's right. Always. And you know, I learned this and maybe I didn't tell you about this, but when I was a Hewlett Packard and the dot-com bubble burst, one of the hardest things I had to do was fire people because it was totally outside of my control even, right? It was not something I had done that affected the performance of the business, but I had so many engineers at my command that I was handed a blanket order 
you know, a blanket order with names on it that said, these are the, these are the engineers that you need to get rid of next week. Hmm. And I, and I sobbed, man, I, I, I grieved for this, for this man and this women, because I was handed a termination order that I had no control over that I had not, I was no authority, no decision. It was just passed on to me. I was not allowed to make any questions. I was not allowed to tell them I, I, I feel sorry for them because of liability issues. I was not allowed to give them a hug on their way out. I was not allowed to do any of it. And that marked me, man. That marked me forever. So I said, look, I, this can happen to me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not gonna let it happen to me. And, and what else? If I can avoid it myself, I don't wanna be the executioner for somebody else ever again. You know, being an entrepreneur is hard. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that, that, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. But they go to work from nine to five and they come home and they forget about the real work that has to start. Hmm. We have to be diverse in what we do. We have to diversify our businesses today. We have to diversify our minds into which direction we're going to go. And, and, uh, Ron, I know you had uh, you had told me uh, earlier. I mean, you walked away from a six-figure income mm. and said, "You know what? I'm ready to get away from the corporate world. I, I'm ready to do it for me." Yeah. And you you said something when we talked the other day. I want to be able to have time and freedom mm. to do the things I truly want to do, be, not be tied down by the corporate world so that I can have the time to do what I want to do. Can everybody see Carlos's kids in the back? He's getting patted against the head. He's, he's, he's playing dodgeball with me and I'm, and I'm not playing back. <laughs> so so you're, tell me. Tell Carrie, you, you're infringing on the dodgeball time. <laughs> <laughs> we're, tell them we're just about done, just to tell they can beat you up in just a few minutes. That's what I told them. <laughs> But tell us about that a little bit, Ron. I mean, you, you just said, hey, this is me and this is what I want to do. And you right. as an entrepreneur, yes. you have to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, I I wanted a life. I mean, I I I if I'm speaking to anybody here that's uh, been in the corporate environment, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you know. You, you spend your entire lifetime working for a corporation and you don't have control. You, you've given up all control to that paycheck. And um, I've had great success in, in my career in the, in the financial world, but it, it really got to the point in time where I just wanted the same amount of success in time that I had in finances. And, and I just, I, I, I kept looking for the solution. I kept looking for how do I get my life back? I don't want to give up this incredible income stream, but why can't I have both halves? Why can't I truly have what we all have, have heard is, you know, the American dream of not only have financial independence, but have the time to actually enjoy the fruits of your labor. And, and, so that uh, I, I just embarked on a on a journey to really try to find and identify how I could make that work, and you know it's 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 difficult. I mean, it's to be able to. Most people go about leveraging their finances, which we know is that four letter word called debt, to get and accomplish success, right? And, and right now, money is so cheap, we're at the lowest interest rates in the history of the world. I mean, we're talking about interest rates were higher than this when Jesus walked the earth, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's interesting how things are, are developing out there. But that's one type of leverage, and that involves a lot of risk, as we well know. But the other type of leverage that does not involve risk is how can you leverage time? How can you find more than 24 hours in your day? Because once you find that, and of course, you the entrepreneurs go and hire employees and they're making money off those employees and that's one way for leverage. But 
there needs to be a better way, in my opinion, that you can build that leverage in time and have not just 24 hours in your day, but what if you could have 100 hour days, 200 hour days, 1000 hour days without the same risk factors that traditional businesses take on um, as they hire employees and all those types of things. And uh, what's the number one expense for all businesses? It's employees. So the first thing that they're going to do, and and this is going to accelerate a lot more of that, is anything that can be transitioned to robotics and, and how can I use the internet more to have less and less employees. So if people don't see the writing on the wall, it's, it's obvious that people need to reinvent themselves and find a solution that gives them long-term and preferably legacy income streams. Um, because that's really, at the end of the day, that's what the entrepreneur wants to build. He wants to build a business to be able to pass it on to his children and his children's children. And so that's something that um, has been my pursuit and uh, we're very, very excited about uh, what we're doing at this point in, in that direction. Guys, we're just a few minutes over here, and I know Carlos is just dying to go get beat up. So uh, <laughs> I, I can't thank you. Thank you both enough for taking this time out of your evening and and uh, most importantly, your friendship and the love that we share for one another. You know, it's I, I mean, I've, I literally have two brothers on the screen right here from another mother, you know. And uh, but Carlos, I'm going to get you to uh, to to give us a little wrap up. Then I'm going to get Ron to wrap it up, and uh, we'll close this thing out. Once again, thank you both so so much for your input, your knowledge, and sharing with everybody out there. That I mean, direction right now is important, and giving the direction that you've given tonight, Carlos. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate you. Look, uh, first of all, an honor always to share a screen with you and share some words and. Look, we we haven't had the the blessing of meeting each other in person yet, but I'm looking so forward to that very very soon. As soon as they let us leave their houses, right, and and start acting like human beings again. But one of the things that I really want to finish this with is the importance of finding people that you can follow because of the results that they have in the areas of your life that you want to go after and improve and achieve, right? If you want to have a great business and you want to build a great business, be humble enough to raise your hand, ask questions, Mm -hmm. and be really attentive to learning them and executing as they're handed to you. Every single business owner that has has achieved success has done so by having a system, a precise system that is repeatable, that is predictable, and that allows for the business to continue to succeed even if the business owner is not present at some point. Businesses that are just about the business owner trading dollars for hours are not real businesses. You just bought an, a, another job. It's just different. It's just you carry all the risk. What if you cannot go do the work today? So really be in the hunt when you're building your business or you're starting your business or you are reinventing yourself with this new pandemic situation to find somebody that you can call, that you can ask questions often, and then you can seek advice and that has the success that you want in the business that you want. This is so very key. Yet, so many of us at one point in time, we've struggled because you know what gets in the way, Carrie? Our ego gets in the way. That's right. (laughs) Our, our, Our pride gets in the way because we feel that we know it all. And one of the things that really has helped me succeed over the years, Kerry, is that I have, a, I, have, I have a saying that I say to myself very, very often is like, I just don't know what I don't know. And I need to continue to learn daily from 
sources that provide me with those teachings. And plus, I have a terrible memory, so I forget things. So I need to revisit things often. So systems are critical. Processes are critical. But mentors, coaches, people that are willing to give me a hand are fundamental for success. We are not in the era of being a lone ranger anymore. Mm. You know, another thing that the internet has done is it has allowed situations like this where we can see each other face to face and almost be like we're in the same room. Yes. Learn from each other, coach each other, help each other with our collective knowledge and experience, mastermind, come with solutions together. These things that exist today, just even 10 years ago, were impossible without having an in-person meeting, right? So the speed at which business moves today because of technology like the one we're using right now is incredibly fast. So unless you adapt to that and let yourself be carried by somebody that is just maybe a little bit ahead of you and be wise enough to say, man, this guy has already gone through what I probably will go through, why not learn from his or her experience instead of myself making those mistakes, right? right. So staying humble is huge. Having processes, systems in place is key. And having mentors is fundamental. So true. Ron? Yeah, Kerry, it just... Um... I think it, I don't know that it's obvious to everybody, so I'm just going to toss out a few things. You're seeing huge winners and huge losers out there right now, okay? You're seeing businesses that are just absolutely being gutted, the airline industry, the entire travel industry, all these things. There's no real timetable for when these guys are going to come back and, and saying, oh, when, when is it going to be normal again? We don't know. There's, 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 there's so many question marks. And then on the other side of the coin, you've got huge winners. Okay. And, and I want to kind of point to that because that perhaps might give you some clue as to some directions that you might want to take. So at the same time, we're having um, companies that are getting absolutely devastated and their stock prices are reflecting that. We also have companies that are hitting new all-time highs, and I'm just going to single out a couple, and I'm going to talk about the Walmarts of the world, the Amazons of the world, and the Costcos of the world, okay? What kind of product lines are they in? They're in basic consumable products, products you need to consume every single day, and you're going to need to, to buy more. So their their prices are, are hitting all-time highs, and, and others are are seeing something very, very different. And this is a phrase that I've heard many, many times, and I'm sure you've all have heard of it as well, but I believe this is the most, this is the mo the greatest event of our lifetime in terms of what we're seeing on a global basis. I've, I've been through more market crashes and went through the crash of 87, uh, the early 90s, uh, the 2000 tech wreck that Carlos so fondly remembers uh, as he donated some funds back to some uh, uh, in, in the financial world. Um, and then again, um, 2007, 2008. OK, here again, another big uh, downturn in the uh, in the real estate area. And here we have another uh, situation that's developed very, very rapidly. So out of great adversity comes even greater opportunity. You're going to have sure. amazing, amazing businesses that are being birthed right now because of that adversity that Carlos talked about. The ones that are going to be the ones that adapt the fastest to the changing environment that they see and build a business that, that maximizes these changes as opposed to hoping we go back to the good old days and how do we get back to normal again. And that's what we are extremely excited about to take advantage of these times and press forward and lean into that storm. And um, we're very, very excited about what we're doing. 
And, you know, that's one thing we have to do right now. And, and I say this to everybody watching this show, to everybody that watches it when we get off of here, you have to stop, you have to breathe, and you have to realize today is the day that you start. Don't wait till tomorrow or you'll never do anything. Start today. Start planning. Start putting together your future because this is either going to slow down and pick up. It could pick up and not come back. It could pick up and go away. And then in the wintertime, we're back in the same position. You control your destiny. You control where you're at financially. I hear people all the time say, uh, gosh, Carrie, I, I, I don't know what to do. I can, I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay. I'm going to tell you like my, my grandfather used to tell me. You pick yourself up by the short pants sure. and you get moving forward and you don't look back until you figure it out. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you tonight. These two men that are on this screen are my mentors. They take me every single week to a different level in my life. They mm. have become exceptional friends, guys I can call on in the middle of the night. We want to help each and every one of you. It, it, it regardless of what you want to do, which direction you want to go, we know that cash is king, period, <laughs> because without it, you're not going to move forward. And we want to help you. We want to teach you. We want to mentor you. So if that is something you're interested in, just shoot me a message in Messenger and uh, we'd be more than happy to contact you. We're going to be back here next week. At 8.30, unfortunately, I won't have this King crew with me, but uh, we, we will have somebody with us. And uh, actually, I'm going to try to bring James Wood on here, man. <laughs> in for a treat. And uh, But, guys, I want to thank you so much. I love you both so much, man. I, I, there's not a minute that goes by that I don't think about you and appreciate you and everything you do. And um, I hope to have you back soon. Thanks so much, Gary. Have an amazing night, guys. No matter what you do, give it your all. That's it. See you at yeah. the top. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.